So hello and welcome to the Maryland Insurance Administration's event for current and potential small businesses. The Maryland Insurance Administration has partnered with the Small Business Administration for today's event to help us provide resources available for small businesses. Before we start, I'm going to go through some housekeeping rules. Today's event is being recorded. Please make sure that you stay muted during the presentation and cameras off unless you are a presenter. During the event, when you have questions, please utilize the chat box. After the program, we will open it up for questions, starting with the questions that have already been submitted into the chat. Once the Q&A begins, please continue to stay muted and continue to use the chat box to answer any questions. So building your own business from the ground up is an exciting opportunity, but it can also be very challenging and can come with many risks, but the rewards can be well worth it. This webinar was designed to provide information to help current and potential small business owners protect themselves, their staff, and their products, as well as to let them know about other resources within the state to help their businesses grow, and be successful. So we're going to have our first presenter today, Tanya McCoy from the US Small Business Administration talk to you. So welcome Tanya and thank you. Good morning, thank you so much. It is really an honor to be a part of this forum today. I bring greetings to you all on behalf of our, district, our Baltimore Office District Director, Steve Umberger. We're always really excited about partnering with our state, local, and federal partners. So first, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna give you a, um, do an overview of SB programs and services. Next slide, please. Every business starts with a dream and turning this dream into a reality requires confidence, passion, perseverance, and knowledge. Wherever you are in growing your business, SBA can help you. SBA can help you start, grow, expand, and recover your business. Oftentimes, business owners don't realize how much SBA have to offer and can help you in numerous ways. Next slide, please. The SBA has a huge network of resource partners that are available to help you. The services are free. However, some of their workshops and webinars, they may charge a small fee. Don't get mad at them, get mad at us. We mandate that they generate revenue. So they do it by the webinars and the workshops. When you need reliable advice to start or grow your business, the SBA can connect you with expert experts who understand the business climate at both a national level as well as in your specific region or market. Our resource partners are category, some of them are categorized from in a geographical area, and then some are categorized by their expertise. So no matter what area you're in in Maryland or what, the, what industry you're in, we have resource partners available that can help you. The SBA resource partners help to extend our reach to serve the nation's small business community outside our district offices. Whether you need to create a successful business plan, get expert, expert advice on expanding your business, or train your team, trust me, SBA makes sure you're never, you're never far from the resources that you need. We're always here to help you. Next slide, please. One of, the, one of the biggest avenues or services that a lot of people will come to SBA for is our certification and contracting programs. The SBA works with federal agencies to award at least 23% of all prime government contracting dollars each year to small businesses. We have four certification programs that, all, that will help small business owners perform on government contracts at a, as a prime contractor. I will say that if you've never worked in the federal government contracting arena before, I would suggest you to start as a subcontractor, not as a prime contractor. Working on a, a federal prime contract is completely different than working on a um, contract with the private sector. 
So that's why we suggest and encourage business owners to start as a subcontractor instead of a prime contractor. SBA can help evaluate your readiness and provide access to helpful resources. You can visit beta.certified.sba.gov to see if you qualify for our certification programs. Next slide, please. There are more than 300 procurement technical assistance centers across the nation that provide local in-person counseling and training services to businesses that want to sell products and services to the federal, state, and local government. PTAC services are available, PTAC services are available free of charge or at a nominal cost. And I encourage anyone that wants to get into the federal government sector to please reach out to one of the PTACs for assistance. They have, a, they have representatives throughout the state. They're there to help you. They will help you maneuver through the language of the federal contracts. They will help you understand better how to bid on contracts. What happens if you do not get the contract? What happens with the debriefing? If their schedule allow, a lot of times they can attend a debriefing with you to sort of help you understand why you did not get that contract. Next slide, please. Everyone's favorite, financing. Do you need a business loan to get started or maybe grow your business or maybe expand your business? We're here to help you no matter what industry you're in or how long you've been in business. SBA can connect, can connect you with different types of funding sources and will help you determine the one that's right for you. We have resources available to help you determine which loan product is right for your business and your industry. SBA loan programs are designed with the unique needs of small businesses in mind. Longer repayment terms, hmm, that's interesting. Longer, lower payments and no prepayment penalties can give you the flexibility you need to grow your business while meeting your financial obligations. Let's go back to longer repayment terms. Now it's according to the amount you're borrowing your use of proceeds and how long your business has been in existence will help determine your repayment terms. I think that SBA program probably have the most flexible programs um, when you look at traditional financing. They may not be as flexible. That's why the lenders really love working with our programs because we guarantee our loans. Then the guarantee is for the lender. SBA loan guarantees make it possible for many small businesses to access the capital they need to start, grow, and expand their businesses. If you have not considered financing, um, consider SBA loan programs. We don't want you to use all of your savings to start your business or expand your business. Something happens, then you may need the money. You know how the old saying goes, when you absolutely need the money, you're not able to get the money. So we want you to be proactive. Again, there's no prepayment penalty, so you can always pay back early. Next slide, please. How can SBA back loans help you? I'm so glad you asked that question. Let me help you understand that a little bit more. The SBA can help you access funding through a number of lending programs for various uses to meet your unique business needs at any stage of the business life cycle. SBA-backed loans can be used for most business purposes, including long-term fixed assets and operating capital. Some loan programs set restrictions on how you can use funds. So with an SBA-approved lender, we request, use an SBA-approved lender when requesting a loan. It's better if you use an SBA-approved lender when requesting a loan because the lender understand our requirements, what we require. It's a two-step process. One, the lender is gonna get the first level of approval, then they're gonna forward it on to us for our second level of approval. Then the funds can be dispersed. Your SBA lender, my apologies. Your SBA lender can match you with the right loan for your business need and the approval amount can be anywhere from $500 to $5.5 million, $5 million. Next slide, please. Let's talk about lender match. 
Lender Match is a program that SBA created to do just that, match the business owner with the lender. Lender Match can help you connect with an SBA approved lender if you are credit worthy. If you're not quite credit worthy, our resource partners can help you prepare and get to that point to become credit worthy so you can apply for a loan for your business. There are four steps to this process. One, fill out the questionnaire and describe your needs. Two, wait for the interested lender to contact you. And this usually takes about 40, 48 hours for it to begin. Three, talk with the lender so they can learn more about your financing needs. And four, go ahead, apply for that loan. Next slide, please. International, international trade. Have you thought about exporting? If you are ready to explore exporting, the SBA have an export assistance center to help you. Some are collated with the Department of Commerce or Exim Bank. We call the UZAC. The UZX have international trade counselors to assist you with understanding the world of conducting business overseas and as well as export financing. There, there are over 300 UZX nationwide and we have one right here in Baltimore in downtown Baltimore 300 West Pratt Street. Next slide, please. The phone number for the UZX is on the screen. Please, if you're considering um, exporting, please contact them. They're there to help you. They're counselors and representatives that they really know their stuff. Thank you. Next slide, I think this is the end of my presentation. Yes, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. And I thank you for your time listening to my presentation today. Thank you, Tanya, that was very informative. Um, so I'm just gonna piggyback off of what Tanya was talking about and provide you with some resources that um, are offered in the state of Maryland. Next slide. So one office is the governor's office and it's for small minority and women business affairs. So the governor's office role is to connect the small businesses to greater economic opportunities that are offered in public and private sectors within the state. Next slide. So it's called state procurement programs. So the government procurement is the process by which the government acquires the goods and services it needs by purchasing from small businesses. And I believe Tanya touched on this a little bit um, in her presentation. So there's different types of programs, the Maryland Minority Business Entre um, Enterprise, so MBE, the Small Business Reserve, which is called the SBR, and the Veteran Owned Small Business Enterprise, the VSBE. Next slide. So first, the Maryland's Minority Business Enterprise MBE program. So this seeks to help create solutions to prevent discrimination for small minority and women owned businesses within the state contracting arena. Um, below there's some override overall statewide participation that has to take place. So 70 state agencies and departments participate in the MBE program. And while certification is not required in order to do business within the state, only certified firms can meet the MBA goals set on state contracts. Certified firms are listed in an online directory. And at the top, you will actually see the email address um, for that. Next slide. So to participate, agencies and departments examine their procurements and set specific minority participation goals on a contract by contract basis. And the procedures are followed to assure that an award of a contract is not made until a prime contractor has met the established MBE goals. And that's by contracting with a certified small minority owned or woman owned firm or has demonstrated a good faith effort to meet those goals. So the Office on Minority Business Enterprise, a division of the Maryland Department of Transportation, so MDOT, is the state official certification agency. And you'll see down below is um, a website as well. So part of it, Minority Disadvantaged Business 
Enterprise is the tab you would use on the MDOT website to find out more information. Next slide. So SBR, the Small Business Reserve. And up, up top, you will see actually the website for you to use to get on to learn more about this program. The SBR program is a race and gender neutral program that requires participating state agencies to direct 15% of their spending with registered SBR vendors. And in this unique marketplace, this gives um, small businesses a chance to compete against other small businesses for contracts. Next slide. So then we have the S the VSBE, which is the Veteran Owned Small Business Enterprise. And you will see the website to learn more about this program as well. So the Maryland VSBE program provides contracting opportunities on state funded procurements for qualified veteran owned small businesses. And to find more information about that, you can find that as well on the website. What are the qualifications? Next slide. So eMaryland Marketplace Advantage is the website, the marketplace to get on to learn more about procurement contracts with state governments. So it'll also give you contracting information for state, county, and local government entities. When registering as a new vendor on EMMA, look for the section titled Procurement Programs, State Programs, and navigate to the appropriate program. And then this way you'll get a listing of all of the contracts being offered. As a vendor, you will have the ability to complete the small business reserve self-certification, receive notice of bid opportunities, search for contracting opportunities, submit bids electronically and obtain bid results online. And again, all of this will be done through the eMaryland Marketplace Advantage. Next slide. So once you register on the eMarket Marketplace as a vendor, you can monitor the email notifications you receive to determine what agencies buy what you sell and what frequency and at what dollar amount. So our, um, the annual procurement forecasts are also available for new or recurring procurements expected to exceed up to 100,000. So the reports can be found on, again, the Governor's Office of Small Minority and Women Business Affairs website. And then the report will contain all of the details needed and what are they looking for as far as contractors. Next slide. So another um, resource is the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. And they have small business and startups in Maryland can get help to go through, to grow through a range of financing programs available through them. And again, you'll see the website below. Programs for the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development are designed to support lending and financing through traditional lenders and can make the difference between a project launching or not. Next slide. So these are some of the financing opportunities that you will find on their website. Collaborative financing, loan participation, so it allows banks to reduce borrow exposure and or increase loan amounts. The collaborative financing, they pair neighborhood business works with bank CDF FI financing for permanent takeouts, bridge loans, construction loans, etc. And they do credit enhancement and guarantees. Next slide. So these programs are available to businesses that are located or will be located in Maryland sustainable communities. And the prior in the funding areas would be neighborhood business works, um, micro enterprise loan, link deposit, Maryland capital access program. And below you will see what are considered to be sustainable communities. And it would be communities where they develop a healthy local economy, protection and appreciation of historical and cultural resources, a mix of land use, affordable and sustainable housing and employment options, growth and development practices that protect the environment and conserve area, water and energy. So if anyone has a business with that fits in these rooms, you could also look into um, getting loans in those Maryland sustainable communities. Next slide. 
So the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development also has grants for Project Restore. So Governor Hogan recently announced a 25 million initiative to revitalize downtowns and main streets. And Project Restore will provide financial support to Maryland small businesses and commercial developers reoccupying or investing in vacant commercial and retail space. Um, again, you will be able to find out more information about Project Restore on the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development website. Next slide. So who is eligible for Project Restore? Small businesses of 50 or fewer employees will be eligible for additional benefits, available incentives, sales tax relief rebates equals to the business sale tax receipts for the 12 month period with a maximum of 250,000 per year. Businesses in tier one counties, which includes Baltimore City and any opportunity zone in Maryland will be eligible to receive the rebate for two years of operation. Businesses in tier two counties will be eligible to receive the rebate for the first full year of operation. And additional small business applicants will be eligible for rental subsidies of 2,500 per month for 12 months up to 30,000 to help offset the startup costs during the first year. So there are eligible guidelines that need to be followed that you will find again on the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development website. But to qualify for Project Restore, eligible entities must begin new or expanded operations in space that has not been generating sales tax receipts for the past six months or more. All applicants commit to occupying the space for a minimum of 12 months following receipt of the grant. And below you will see the website, which is dhcd.maryland.gov slash project restore for more information. Next slide. And also there's a, a contact for the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. And he would be the one you would contact. You will see his email address as well as his phone number 301-429-7523. And he's the Director of Business Lending Programs. Next slide. And then last is the Maryland Department of Commerce. You will see above their email, I mean, their website, excuse me, and their Maryland financial incentives for businesses. So accessing capital and securing financing are essential to start your business and to help grow. So the Maryland Department of Commerce offers programs to attract new companies to the state. And these programs will offer venture capital investments, tax credits, direct loans, and grants. And to get more information about the programs being offered, again, you would get on the website, Maryland Department of Commerce for more information. Next slide. And then for Commerce Small Business Resource Contacts, I have listed some names here of people you can contact as well as their direct phone number and email address if you have any questions about being, any programs being offered for small businesses through the Department of Commerce. Okay, next slide. And then next up, um, we have Ms. Joy Hatchett, who will be talking about commercial insurance for your business. Thanks, Kiana. So we've had great presentations from both Tana and from Kiana, and they've really talked to you about funding and resources that are available. What I'm gonna focus on is something that a lot of small business current owners currently that are operating, or if you're thinking about getting into and opening a small business, you don't necessarily think about how important this is. But insurance is one of the key things that any small business owner really needs to think about because if in fact you have a loss while you're operating your business and you are not properly insured, is it is one of the ways 
that small businesses will not be able to recover and lose the any money that they have put into that business. So all the things that Tanya and Kiana have talked about will be for naught if you don't purchase the right type of insurance. And so I've got a presentation that really goes into a lot of detail, but I'm not going to go into that kind of detail during our talk today. The slide presentation that will be available to you to print out will go into a lot more depth. But what I'm gonna to try to do today is just give you some of the questions and information that we hear when we're out and about from business owners that either have had a claim or that know someone that's had a claim. So the place that I wanna start is probably some of you have never even heard of the Maryland Insurance Administration. Next slide, please. So, and then one more, please. So we are the state agency that regulates the business of insurance. We make sure that the insurance companies comply with Maryland law and we look at all types of things and we do it for all lines of business. So think of us basically as the ones that are making sure that the business of insurance is conducted in compliance with Maryland law. And if you ever have an issue or a problem with an insurance company or an insurance producer, and a producer is somebody that you guys normally know as your agent or broker. If you ever have an issue with any of those people, you can come to us and we can assist you with that. We are a regulatory agency, so we don't sell insurance. Our primary purpose is to make sure that consumers are protected and they are a getting their um, policies in accordance with Maryland law. Next slide, please. And let's go ahead and to the next slide. So let me talk for a minute about commercial insurance. Commercial insurance is different than most other types of insurance. I mean, you guys are probably very familiar with dealing with auto and homeowners where for the most part, the policies are essentially the same. Basically, you buy a policy and it, you know specifically what it covers and what it doesn't cover. You may have to do a little bit of customizing, but for the most part, the policy is what the policy is. Well, when it comes to commercial insurance, it's different. The policy that you should be purchasing really needs to match the business type that you have. So you're looking at what your risk characteristics are for your business and what type of exposure you have to the risk. So let me explain what I mean. So let's say you basically operate a dry cleaner. So that dry cleaner deals with certain chemicals. It has people that are coming in and out of the business. So those are sort of risks that you need to think about and plan for. Now, let's say you have a different type of business where you are basically operating a motor pool and you drive consumers around from venue to venue, then your risk is very different than basically for someone operating a dry cleaning business. And then also you need to look at, do you have employees? And if you have employees, are they driving vehicles for you? What exactly are they doing? What, and then you also look at what products you produce. So let's say you are um, working on people's homes, building homes, that's one kind of risk, or you're making expensive jewelry, that's another type of risk. 
So all of those risks need to be considered when you're purchasing insurance. And you need to think about, okay, do I own my own building? Do I lease a building? And all of those things will actually dictate what kind of policy you purchase and what type of coverage you need. And you as an individual business owner may not understand and know all of the types of in particular coverages you need. So the best way that you can make sure that your business and yourself are protected is getting a insurance producer that is familiar and understands the nature of your business and is able to work with you side by side to evaluate your particular risk. Next slide, please. And so this just goes over a little bit more about what kinds of considerations and things you need to take into account when you are thinking about purchasing commercial policies. And one of the things that I have found is once you've had your business, it's going to be important for you to reevaluate and your business probably on a yearly basis, because if there are changes in that risk, you may need to change your insurance coverage. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start out with talking about automobile insurance for your vehicles. And the real challenge I think a lot of people have is do I need a commercial policy or will my personal automobile insurance policy cover my vehicle when I'm doing and using it in connection with uh, my particular business? And what I tell people is it is going to depend on the insurance company that you have. And the best way that you can find out if you need a commercial policy is to ask that trusted insurance producer and explain to them how you're using that vehicle and whether or not the particular policy you have will cover you. Because sometimes with some personal auto policies, there may be a rider that you can buy, or for some companies, they're gonna specifically say to you, you must have a commercial policy. And one of the questions that we get sometimes is, well, does it really make a difference? Let me explain. If you don't have a commercial policy and you are operating your personal vehicle and an accident occurs, that is a basis for the insurance company to deny your claim. And some people may say, well, it only means that I have to pay to repair my vehicle. Well, what if it's a more serious accident where you damage several people's vehicles, or God forbid, you end up injuring another person or killing that other person. If you don't have the correct policy in place, all of that responsibility comes back to you personally. So it is very important for you to determine and talk with that trusted producer slash agent to find out if you have the right policy for you doing business. All, next slide, please. One of the things that they're gonna, the producer is gonna ask you is, 
is how is the vehicle owned? Do you own it personally? Does the business own it? Who drives that vehicle? Is it you or is it an employee? Now, please understand that if you have a vehicle and you have employees driving it, more likely than not, you are going to have to have a commercial policy. And one of the things that the insurance company is going to look at is the driving records of those employees. So if you have employees and a, one or two of them have horrible driving records, then you're going to be paying more for insurance because of those horrible driving records. But it's much better for you to know that up front than for that employee with the horrible driving record to go out, get into an accident, and your insurance company deny that claim because you didn't have the right coverage. Next slide, please. The other big thing that a lot of companies will look at is whether or not there are any restrictions on the way that the employee uses that vehicle. Are they allowed to take it home? Are they allowed to um, drive it around for not only business use, but for their personal use? So all of those things, as I said, are things that your trusted insurance producer will ask you. Next slide, please. And then what you'll see on the next couple of slides are just some tips about things that you should consider and when you're talking about this particular commercial auto policy. Please forward the slides. And what, okay. Now let's talk about you and the space and the equipment that you use for your business. So there are a couple of things that may, as a business owner, you may do. You may actually own your own building and use that for your business, or you may lease your space from someone else. And what I tell people is, even if you're leasing that space, it is important that you understand what that lease agreement says when it comes to your responsibility for the structure. And the reason I'm saying that is some landlords will basically put all liability back on the tenant when it comes to improvements, when it comes to liability. So it's very important when you're leasing a space to have someone that understands those types of contracts and understand what you are personally responsible for when it comes to the space. Because they, the landlord could even say, you have to purchase insurance on the structure. And that sometimes is buried in the fine print. So it's much better before you sign a lease for anything that you understand that. There also may be requirements when you are leasing that you're going to be the one that's responsible for the improvements for to the space. So improvements can be anything from putting in shelving, painting, all of that. So once again, that is going to be directly dictated by the contract. And what a lot of small business owners do is they hire an attorney or talk with someone that is in the business to help them understand what are what should be expected 
when they are getting this new space. Then also along with the space, you need to think about the equipment that you will be either owning or leasing to operate your business. And the equipment could be something as simple as a few tables or shelving, or it could be actually very complicated equipment. And so you may need to get a specific insurance policy to cover that equipment. So those are all types of insurance considerations that you as a small business owner need to take into account. Next slide, please. And you'll see on this slide, a list of the different types of equipment and things that you need to consider when you are thinking about what to insure and how much, and that's the big thing, how much coverage you need. Next slide, please. And then these are some other considerations that you should think about. Next slide. So one of the things, and this is the same with your homeowner's policy. There are two different types of coverage. There's something called actual cash value, and the other is replacement cost value. So let me start by explaining what actual cash value is. Basically, and this is also known as ACV. So think about it this way. You buy a table and today that table is worth $100. Over time, that table depreciates. So five years from now, that $100 table may only be worth $50. If you buy an actual cash value policy, you will only get the $50. That's the amount that the table is worth at the time of your insurance claim. Now, the other type of policy is something called replacement cost policy. And it's exactly what it sounds like. If you have a loss, then you will get the amount it costs to replace it with something that's similar, kind, and quality. But here's the key. You have to actually replace it. So if you decide you don't want to replace that table and you only want to take what the insurance company is going to give you, then they're only going to give you the actual cash value. You don't get replacement cost until you actually replace the item. So you may ask, well, why would I want a actual cash value versus a replacement cost policy? The actual cash value policies are generally less expensive than the replacement cost policies. So you just need to make sure that if you're counting pennies and you want to save money, then you may choose to get an actual cash value policy. But you will not be in, if you have a claim, you will not get back in the same position you were before the loss because you're only going to get the amount that you paid minus the depreciation which in many circumstances can be a lot less. Next slide, please. So the other thing that we hear often is I can't operate my business because either there's been a fire or there's been some other disaster and I've lost everything. I need my income. Well, there's a specific type of insurance that you can get to replace that. It's generally called business interruption or continuation of insurance. 
But first of all, in order to recover for those, it has to be a, for the purposes of a actual covered loss. For example, if your policy that you have does not cover flooding and you have a loss and can't operate your business because of a flood, even if you have business interruption insurance, it won't kick in because you don't have flood insurance to cover your business. So two things have to happen. You have to purchase the business interruption coverage and you have to have a loss based on a covered item under the terms of your policy. Now, also one of the things that we frequently hear is that the insurance company won't pay my business interruption claim. And getting the claim paid, you as a business owner are gonna to have to be able to do some paperwork. You're gonna to have to be able to show the loss. You're gonna to have to be able to go back and say, let's say the loss occurred in July. You're gonna to have to go back and show what type of revenue you took in last year in July to actually show that this July, you would have taken in the same amount of revenue. So it means that you're going to have to keep really good books and records because if you can't prove that you've actually had a loss, then the insurance company is going to be hesitant to pay the claim. Next slide, please. And this just gives you some more information about business interruption insurance. And one of the things to know is most of those policies may have a specific time period before it kicks in. A lot of them won't kick in immediately. You have to be out of business for a few days. Usually it's less than a week, but that's once again, where it's very important that you understand the terms and the requirements of your particular policy. Next slide, please. So liability, commercial general liability policies. Basically, those are the policies that cover claims that would occur if somebody slips and falls in your business or if you happen to have, let's say, um, a, you produce um, widgets and someone is damaged or injured because of your widget, or you have um, a market and you sell food and someone eats that and becomes very ill, or you damage someone's reputation that slander or libel, all of those things would be covered under the liability type of policy. Next slide, please. And then this just goes into a little bit more detail about that. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, I know all of you have been reading recently about all these cyber attacks and security breaches, and you probably are thinking, well, that only applies to big businesses. Well, in this day and age, I hate to say it applies, as to, applies to businesses of all sizes. It can be from the small mom and pop to the big companies. Basically, anytime you're dealing with any type of sensitive information, and yes, that includes when you accept payment 
by using credit cards or collect any type of consumer information, there can be hackers that are going in and trying to get that information. So cyber liability insurance is something that you really should consider purchasing. Next slide, please. Flood insurance. Now, most business policies do not cover flood insurance. You will have to purchase a separate flood insurance policy. And what I tell people, both businesses and homeowners, if it can rain at your business or home, your business or home could flood. So really consider that coverage when you are basically thinking about what type of coverage you need. And if you can't afford it, then make sure you take steps to mitigate and protect against losses. And what do I mean by take steps? Make sure that you raise things off the floor, install shelves so your expensive products or your expensive uh, equipment such as computers and things of that nature are not directly on the floor. And flood insurance can be purchased either through the federal government and also many private insurers offer flood insurance. Next slide, please. And this just goes into a, a little bit more detail about flood insurance. Next slide. And please um, go ahead to the next one. Okay. So there's one option that you basically can buy what's called a package policy, a business owner's policy, also known as a BOP. And that's going to include a lot of these coverages that I just went over, but just be careful when you purchase a BOP because sometimes it will not cover your particular business needs. So once again, that trusted insurance producer can help you understand if the BOP will work for you. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I want to misspend, and this is almost my last slide. I know you're getting a little bit tired. I'm going over a lot of information. Is dealing with when you operate your business from your home, especially during the pandemic where people have started their own businesses. A lot of people have started to basically operate their business out of their home and they really haven't thought about the insurance consequences of that. They basically think that their homeowner's policy is going to cover them. Well, I hate to say it, depending on the type of business, what you're doing, the risk, your homeowner's policy may very well not cover it at all, but even if it does cover it, there may be very limited coverage. So once again, I can't stress enough that that trusted producer is somebody that you need to talk with to make sure that you have the appropriate coverage. Next slide. And so what I've done is over the next couple of slides is giving you some tips and things you need to think about on when it comes to how to reduce your particular risk. Next slide. Next slide. And then the next couple of slides give you some tips and considerations which on how you can reduce the amount that your property and liability insurance will cost. 
And that's going to be very important for you as a small business owner. Next slide. Next slide. So I've covered a lot of information and as indicated before, all of these slides and a recording of this entire presentation will be available on our website. But also if you visit our website, we have tons of materials. We have brochures, we have videos. And then if you have specific questions, just give us a call and we will try to assist you and give you answers and information on those. Thank you very much, Kiana. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Joy. A lot of helpful information. Um, we appreciate both having you and Tanya here to um, basically help small businesses, current or people looking to start a new business. Um, the opportunity to have resources as well as the appropriate information just to make sure that their business is um, successful. So we have a few minutes for any questions. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. Um, thank you again, all of this information will be it's on our website. So it is recorded as well as you can um, ask me for um, access to the slides and I can email them to you. So I will put my email address in the chat box so that you have it. And again, if you have any questions for Joy or Tanya, please um, put them in the chat. Okay, so I do have a question. Um, Joy, do I need workers comp insurance if I have no employees? So if you absolutely don't have employees, then you don't need workers comp. However, I qualifier because sometimes people really don't understand what um, an employee is. So what I would say is when it comes to workers comp, go to the workers comp commission's website to make sure you understand what an employee actually is to make sure, because there are very strict rules on whether or not that coverage should be in place and their fines and other things that go along with that. So what I always tell people is just check with the workers comp commission because they have very strict laws as to what constitutes an employee and when you have to have workers comp coverage. Thank you. And as well as um, Joyce has put into the chat box, the website you can get on to about compensation for commission, workers compensation commission. Also, um, we have an upcoming event, August 25th on annuities. Um, if you are interested, um, please visit our website, which I will put in the chat box where you will get more information about that event. And also too, we are doing something where we're trying to get feedback on events that we have done and that you have attended. So if you could please also send, excuse me, um, also please fill it out. That would be helpful to us so that we can use that for future events. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I'm having a hard time copying these links that you're putting in there. When I go to copy it, it wants me to select all. And then when I try to paste it into an email or something, it's not going from there. It's because I was making a request to have a copy of the slides. Because a lot of times when you go to the websites, it's really a lot of information and you get information overloaded. And what you're really looking for, you can't get. So I didn't want to miss out on that. But when I went to try to copy your email address, it says select all. I hit select all. And when I go to paste it into my email, it's not there. It's something else. Um, Joyce, do you? Yeah, the copy paste uh, factor in um, Zoom chat doesn't work very well. So you would, unfortunately, you would have to handwrite down any web addresses or email addresses you see in the chat. Sorry about that. 
Right, that's not a problem. That's why I was asking it. I'm not sure if it's a lot of us, but if you guys could just send it to us since we're requesting it. Yeah, the, the, the slides and the um, recording will be on our website, hopefully by the end of the week. Once we get the recording, I send it to our IT department to upload to our website. Right, and what I'm trying to explain is a lot of times when you go to the website, it's way more complicated than if you just forward the slides to us because there's 34 of us on here. Yeah, so did you register on Eventbrite? Yes. Okay, so I can send it to you, okay? Thank you. And it's under Ruth Anderson, is that correct? It's Ruth Anderson Cole. Okay. So I can send it to you. And if anyone else would like a copy of the slides, if you could put your email address in the chat box, we will write them down, okay? If that helps. Yes, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to put the link and it should be a clickable link. Is that correct for the, um, for the survey about the event? Joyce, am I correct about that? I'm hoping so. Okay. <laughs> this is new for us, so please forgive us. Okay, yep, it should be clickable. And if you could just please provide us back with some feedback, that would be great. Um, if there's no other questions besides um, having access to the slides, I would like to thank everybody for participating and for joining us and please, um, if you could just get on our website, you will see also additional upcoming events that we will either be at in person or we will be doing virtually. So I thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been very helpful and, inf and informative. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Are we waiting on the survey? The link is in the chat.